Nichols, Assistant Administrator Escobade. Uh, thank you for appearing before us today as we talk about United States policy towards Venezuela and a crisis uh, which has not only serious consequences for our national security, but the stability of our entire hemisphere. Three years ago, I walked out on the bridge at the Colombia-Venezuela border in Cucuta, and I looked out at Venezuela and saw firsthand the misery and desperation in family after family forced to flee their homeland as if it was a building on fire. The collapse of a once thriving modern country, a beacon of stability in our hemisphere turned into a failed state. Run into the ground by Maduro and his thugs, today the situation is even more dire. Venezuela is the epicenter of the second largest refugee and migration crisis in the world. The Maduro regime has overseen the collapse of the economy, taking down with it the country's entire education and health care systems. Basic household items are unaffordable for most Venezuelans. Maduro has weaponized starvation, using it as a political tool to drive over 95 percent of the country, over 26 million people below the poverty level. And as his regime perpetrates crimes against humanity, Maduro traffics cocaine, he enriches himself and his kleptocratic buddies, he invites the Russian, Cuban, Iranian, and Chinese governments into the country. So as we review United States policy towards Venezuela, we must reckon with how, in the span of a generation, a trusted democratic partner has become a mafia state, a criminal enterprise that uses brute force to cling to power. Now, I want to be clear, this committee believes in diplomacy, and Congress has long supported and continues to support a negotiated solution to Venezuela's crisis. But a one-sided deal with a regime that kidnaps American citizens to increase its leverage is simply unacceptable. Unilateral concessions to a leader that tortures his political opponents is unacceptable. It's not the path towards a successful negotiation. And it's something the Biden administration, as well as newly elected leaders across Latin America, should keep in mind. Because given Maduro's track record, given that he makes Al Capone look tame, there can be no return to normalcy with this regime, not without the release of American hostages and Venezuela's political prisoners, not without a path to free and fair elections, the restoration of human rights, and a return to the rule of law. If the regime won't seriously commit to these conditions, we must use the power of our peaceful diplomatic tools imposing swift and severe consequences on the regime. Because while Maduro uses the prospects of negotiations to buy himself time, the physical and mental health of American hostages is deteriorating by hour. As is the Venezuelan people's hopes for freedom as they face violence, imprisonment, and hunger every day. Let's not forget that this crisis has forced nearly 7 million people. We talk about the Ukrainians who have fleed, and certainly we are in solidarity with them. But the world hardly whispers about the nearly 7 million people who have fleed Venezuela since 2014. Think about that. That says almost as many refugees as the entire population of the state of New Jersey. In fact, that's more refugees than the combined populations of Idaho, Connecticut, South Dakota, and Wyoming. Everyone needs to do more to protect Venezuelan refugees and migrants across the hemisphere. And the United States should be leading the way, protecting Venezuelans who are already here. President Biden's decision to provide Venezuelans with temporary protected status last year was the right choice after President Trump only paid lip service to Venezuelan Americans. But I am very disappointed that President Biden has only provided what was an extension instead of a full redesignation. And I've been disappointed by the international community's failure to keep up with the severity of the humanitarian crisis inside Venezuela. It seems when these crises take place in other parts of the world, we get people's attention. When it's in the Western Hemisphere, we don't. We must all do more. So today I hope to hear the Biden administration's strategy. What are you doing to bring home Matthew Heath, members of the Sitco Six, and other American hostages?
What is the administration doing to raise the price the regime pays for taking American hostages? What is the plan to tackle this sprawling humanitarian crisis? What is your plan to maintain our support for democratic actors, including, but not limited to, interim President Wang Guaido? And how will you empower them to lead negotiations? And what is your plan B if negotiations fail or never even seriously start? When I authored the Bipartisan Verdad Act with many on this committee joining as co-sponsors, I was hopeful for a diplomatic solution. But Venezuela's crisis endures, and that's why I will be introducing the Verdad Expansion Act in the coming weeks, comprehensive new legislation to tighten the screws on the regime. It defines U.S. policy on Venezuela's political crisis. It guides humanitarian assistance. It addresses the Maduro regime's malfeasance and it sends a message to the Venezuelan opposition, to Venezuelan refugees, and to the Venezuelan community here in the United States that we stand with them in their effort to build a peaceful, prosperous, and democratic Venezuela. With that, let me turn to the ranking member, Senator Risch, for his opening statement. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the political, humanitarian, economic crisis provoked by Maduro and his cronies in Venezuela are among the worst pressing national security concerns in the Western Hemisphere. Since 2013, Maduro has dramatically deepened uh, relations with the most dangerous forces in the world. On his watch, Cuba, Russia, China, Iran, and transnational criminal organizations have turned Venezuela into their playground and are using their presence to expand their reach throughout Latin America. Russian exports of sophisticated military technologies and repressive practices to the Maduro regime are a growing threat to the security of Colombia and stability of northern South America. Venezuela's $62 billion debt to China is a formidable challenge to its sovereignty and its adoption of telecommunication technologies developed and controlled by firms vulnerable to pressure by the Chinese Communist Party undermines privacy and human rights. A series of unsuccessful diplomatic efforts to end Maduro's illegitimate regime, compounded by his ability to stay in power through violence, have emboldened the regime and left Venezuelan democratic, democratic forces facing daunting challenges. Unfortunately, the uh, Biden administration has squandered the position of strength it inherited from the previous uh, administration, uh, which was a campaign of maximum and multilateral pressure on the Maduro regime. In 2020, candidate Biden promised the use of multilateral pressure and smart sanctions to stop the Maduro regime and transition to free and fair elections. Instead, the administration is pursuing flawed and incoherent efforts which strengthen the Maduro regime and its criminal network, exacerbated the already horrific humanitarian <coughs> crisis, and allow malign actors like China, Russia, and Iran to continue interfering in our hemisphere, putting American lives at risk. Nearly two years in, the administration has not sanctioned a single entity or individual tied to the Maduro regime, and the European Union has failed to match existing U.S. and Canadian sanctions. In fact, the administration is conceding to Maduro regime by easing sanctions without any concrete progress uh, towards democratic order. Now, I say these things not to start a partisan brawl. I think it's time to look forward, and I think uh, the chairman and I are in full agreement uh, that it's time to uh, do things differently than what we have done in the past. It's past time we reassert American leadership in our hemisphere. The administration should reverse course and increase pressure on the Maduro regime and its enablers until unjustly detained Americans and political hostages are released and the conditions are right to conduct free and fair elections in Venezuela. Over 10 unlawfully detained Americans languish in Venezuelan prisons and detention sites. I urge the administration to pri prioritize North American energy production and infrastructure, persuade our European allies to promptly match U.S. and Canadian sanctions on the Maduro regime, conduct robust freedom of navigation and counter-narcotic operations targeting the Maduro regime's transnational criminal activities, and enhance the capacity of democratic countries in the region to confront the humanitarian and security crisis uh, this, his, regime, his regime is generating. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on whether and how the Biden administration plans to recommit to meaningful policies that address the security threat emanating from Venezuela. And I uh, fully agree with the uh, description of the dire situation that the chairman has laid out. I'm anxious to hear how we can all work together to try to move this forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Senator Risch. Uh, we'll turn to our witnesses. Um, we're pleased to welcome the Honorable Brian Nichols back on the one-year anniversary of his tenure as Assistant Secretary of State for the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Assistant Secretary Nichols previously served as U.S. Ambassador to Zimbabwe and Peru, was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, also served as the Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Colombia. So welcome back. It's also a pleasure to have the Honorable Marcela Escobari, Assistant Administrator of USAID's Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean, as a witness for today's hearing. During her prior tenure in this position under the Obama administration, she was responsible for preparing a proactive strategy to confront the political and humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. She's also served as a senior fellow at Brookings and as executive director for the Center for International Development at Harvard University. Welcome back to you as well. Um, we'll start off with you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, as to both of you, your full statements will be included in the record without objection. We'd ask you to summarize them in five minutes or so so that members of the committee can have a conversation with you. Mr. Secretary, you're recognized. Thanks, sorry. Uh, Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on this important issue. The situation in Venezuela remains one of the worst crises in our hemisphere's history. A country with a proud democratic tradition, blessed with natural resources and a rich biodiversity, and with a vibrant and resourceful population has suffered decades of misery. Venezuela's vital sectors, healthcare, energy, agriculture, manufacturing, and education have all but collapsed. It holds the world's largest proven oil reserves, yet does not even feature in the world's top 20 oil producing countries. Whole tracts of its rich biodiversity have been destroyed by illegal mining and logging. Its lawless border regions provide shelter to myriad illegal actors, not the least of which are narco terrorists who threaten its population and its neighbors. Because more than 90% of its people live in poverty, Venezuela has lost 20% of its population to the largest displacement of people in our hemisphere's history. 6.8 million Venezuelans have fled their homes in the last five years, approaching similar exoduses from Ukraine and Syria. The UN Human Rights Commissioner lists a litany of abuses, illegal detentions, and even killings and torture. In two reports, the Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Venezuela documented extrajudicial executions, enforced disappearances, arbitrary detentions, trafficking in persons, torture, cruel and inhuman or degrading treatment, including sexual and gender-based violence committed by Venezuelan state actors. Beyond the abuses the regime inflicts on its own population, it also wrongfully jails and abuses U.S. citizens, attempting to use them as bargaining chips with the United States. As I, as, as I underscored during my testimony earlier this year before the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the responsibility for the crisis in Venezuela falls squarely on the shoulders of the late Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro. The U.S. government remains firmly committed to the belief that Venezuelans have a right to democracy and deserve a government of their choosing that protects and defends their human rights and fundamental freedoms. We have a role and a responsibility to empower Venezuelans as they work to resolve the many regime-created crises facing their nation, and to once again choose their government through free and fair elections. The United States continues to recognize and support the interim presidency of Juan Guaido and the 2015 democratically elected National Assembly the last truly democratic exercise of popular will in Venezuela. We coordinate closely with President Guaido and his administration, the unitary platform, and those in and outside of Venezuela who support the return to democracy in their homeland. Consistent with the Verdad Act, we continue supporting a negotiated solution out of Venezuela's crisis. In a call on June 8th, President Guaido and President Biden expressed their support for Venezuelan-led negotiations as the best path forward toward a peaceful restoration of democratic institutions, free and fair elections, and respect for human rights and the freedoms of all Venezuelans. The administration's visits to Venezuela earlier this year resulted in a re renewed meetings and negotiations between the regime and the opposition, 
in both Oslo and Caracas. Those visits also achieved the return of two wrongfully detained Americans. The safety and security of U.S. citizens overseas is of the utmost importance, and we will always support the efforts of the President's Special Envoy for Hostage Affairs to bring all wrongfully detained Americans in Venezuela home. U.S. sanctions policy will continue to exert pressure on the Maduro regime while providing ample room for humanitarian relief, including our own commitment of over $2 billion since 2017. As we have previously made clear, we will review our sanctions policies in response to constructive steps by the Maduro regime. The U.S. government, in coordination with allies, will also pursue criminals and fugitives and interdict criminal activity associated with the regime. The seizure of an Iranian Venezuelan jet in the southern cone and the extradition of a regime money launderer from Cape Verde are but two examples of our tireless campaign to seek accountability and justice wherever criminals may hide. We will continue to relentlessly pursue accountability for all actors that engage in corruption or abuse human rights in Venezuela. We also seek humane treatment and freedom for Venezuelan political prisoners. The United States maintained relations and friendship with Venezuela for nearly 200 years. Now the Maduro regime looks to Russia, the People's Republic of China, and Iran for political and economic partnerships that bring few benefits to the Venezuelan people and threaten regional security. We will continue working with our international partners to help Venezuela, help return Venezuela to the community of democracies and improve the lives of all Venezuelans. And we will continue to work with Congress in advancing these goals. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to the committee today, and I look forward to your questions. Administrator Escobar. Am I on? Right. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Venezuela's, humanitar Venezuela's humanitarian crisis is a man-made disaster, and the Venezuelan people's suffering is a direct result of the corruption, failed policies, and the repression of the Maduro regime. USAID responds to the Venezuelan crisis every day. We provide humanitarian assistance to those in the country and those forced to flee. We support the integration of Venezuelan migrants into neighboring countries. And we provide support for a peaceful democratic transition. The regime seems to, betting, seems to be betting that with most Venezuelans too focused on feeding their families to protest, that it can outlast the international community and improve its image. We cannot let that happen, and we must retain a sense of urgency. Let me share what we see on the ground and how USAID is responding. On the economic front, Maduro's mismanagement has led to the worst collapse in the region's history, a contraction of over 86% of GDP in the last decade. The distortions to the economy have made Venezuela the most unequal country in the Americas. The monthly pension is equivalent to just 50 cents a day, while prices are similar to those in the US given the de facto dollarization. Most people cannot afford basic medications, which has led to a rise in preventable diseases, infant mortality, and malnutrition across the country. No wonder millions of Venezuelans see leaving the country as their only option. This massive outmigration of now 6.2 8 million Venezuelans continues to grow. To put this in perspective, nearly one in four Venezuelans have migrated since 2014. This is tearing families apart. And it is also placing tremendous pressure on Venezuela's neighbors, who are still trying to dig out from the pandemic. On the governance side, Maduro is ramping up his repression and has sealed off virtually every opportunity for citizens to exercise their basic rights. In the face of this dire context, USAID focuses on two levels, on exerting as much pressure as possible on the regime and providing as much relief as possible to the Venezuelan people. The United States is the largest humanitarian donor to Venezuela and has provided $1.9 billion in the last five years. Our assistance inside Venezuela is managed end-to-end -end by independent organizations and it does not bolster the Maduro regime. USAID also provides humanitarian assistance to Venezuelans throughout the region and helps partner nations to integrate Venezuelans into their countries. Colombia is the most notable example. 
and we have worked hand in hand with Colombia to implement its historic decision to provide temporary protected status to 2.4 million Venezuelans. We know that successful integration can turn this human tragedy into an engine of growth in the region. Our humanitarian work is saving lives. Yet we know that only through a democratic transition can Venezuelans build a more prosperous country, restore institutions, and reunite their families. To that end, USAID supports a return to democracy in three ways. One, we hold the regime accountable for its abuses. USAID supports human rights defenders that courageously document the regime's repression and advocate for political prisoners and their families. Evidence gathered by these groups has been used by the UN fact-finding mission and the International Criminal Court. Because there is no independent justice system in Venezuela, international bodies are the only hope for holding the regime accountable as evidence of crimes against humanity continues to mount. USAID also supports journalists and independent media to counter the regime's disinformation. Second, we work to improve electoral conditions with a focus on the 2024 elections. We expect the regime may subvert the elections, but the Venezuelan people want elections, the opposition has decided to participate, and we saw in last year's local elections, including the governor's race in Barinas, that a unified opposition can compete and win, even when Maduro cheats. And third, USAID continues to support the interim government of Venezuela and the opposition. A unified opposition and a mobilized citizenry are the best hope for creating democratic change. USAID will continue to stand with the courageous people of Venezuela as they fight to end repression, restore democracy, and build a better future for themselves and their families. Thank you. Well, thank you both. We'll start a series of uh, <clears throat> rounds of questions. Assistant Secretary Nichols, I, I believe clarity is needed on the administration's policies regarding efforts towards negotiations the lifting and potential snapback of sanctions and the stewardship of Venezuelan state assets in the United States. Now, the administration has lifted targeted sanctions on one of Maduro's henchmen, provided a license to Chevron, comfort letters to European oil companies Repsol and Eni. However, as far as I can discern, Maduro has not made any meaningful concessions or concrete step to return to negotiations in Mexico City. As Congress supported for a negotiated solution in Venezuela is neither a blank check nor an open-ended invitation, I'd like to ask, does the administration intend to make any more changes to U.S. sanctions absent specific irreversible steps by Maduro? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our focus is upon returning the parties to formal negotiations. We have been engaged actively uh, to promote that. We coordinate closely with the interim government and the broad opposition, the unitary platform in Venezuela. Uh, the efforts so far have led to multiple rounds of informal negotiations, both in Oslo, in Caracas, uh, and uh, significant advances toward uh, a return to a formal process in Mexico City. How long are we going to wait for a formal of a process to take place? He's buying time. He's taking gold out of the country. He's letting our adversaries actively engage in the Western Hemisphere through Venezuela. How long are we going to... He's got U.S. citizens held hostage. How long are we going to tolerate that? How long is this aspiration to get to some formal negotiation is going to take place. Nicolas Maduro is going to, is making a critical mistake if he thinks that our patience is infinite and that dilatory tactics will serve him well. We stand ready to snap back sanctions and ready to take comprehensive measures if this process does not move So forward. how long will the U.S. wait before snapping back changes to sanctions? We consult very closely with the interim government uh, and the unitary platform, as well as our allies in Europe, the UK, and Canada, as well as in the region, uh, on our collective approach to Venezuela. Uh, 
we had a meeting just yesterday. Uh, I was traveling back from Mexico, but my deputy led that uh, conversation with key uh, allies on this process. Uh, and we will be informed by the views of the interim government and the unitary platform, as well as our partners and allies around the region. Okay, that doesn't give me any sense of uh, our, is our patience inf uh, uh, infinite? Or is it finite? You don't give me any sense of it. It's already taken quite a long time. In the interim, he has turned the nation into a narco state, bilking it of its national patrimony, and nothing is happening. And nothing is happening. So if Maduro refuses to negotiate in good faith or even negotiate at all, what's your plan B to degrade the regime? We will use uh, the various tools that you have given us, uh, sanctions, law enforcement action. Uh, we will work with our partners and allies uh, around the world to ensure that the regime does not secure access to assets that are currently frozen uh, or held by the interim government. We will work assiduously uh, to promote uh, investigations by the International Fact-Finding Mission uh, and other war international bodies like the ICC into the events to shed light on what's going on in Venezuela. Well, and we will Secretary, our sanctions are like a sieve. We are allowing a whole host of countries to uh, get around our sanctions. And Maduro knows it. Turkey, Russia, China, They're doing it with impunity. Of course, Cuba, which provides a security apparatus for the whole Maduro regime to exist in the first place. You know, you talk about independent investigations. Well, the UN Human Rights Council established an independent fact-finding mission on Venezuela 2019. That mission played a central role in investigating and documenting the Maduro regime's systematic violations of international law including extrajudicial executions, forced disappearances, torture, arbitrary detention, but there's much more to be done. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the fact-finding mission and others have mounted damning evidence that the Maduro regime has committed grave human rights abuses that constitute crimes against humanity. Is it your assessment the regime has committed crimes against humanity? The United Nations, the OAS, a uh, large number of non-governmental organizations focused on human rights have all said that the regime has uh, committed crimes against humanity. I think that is the international consensus. Yeah, so this, is that our consensus as well? That's a... That's, a that's what others thing. said. I agree with them. Yeah. What do we say? I think the facts of the uh, offenses of this regime are undeniable, uh, and... Uh, uh, I point to those others, the definition of crimes against humanity, as far as I know, is not codified in U.S. statute. Um, but it's clear that they have committed all of these actions and that the key international bodies, the United Nations and the OAS, uh, consider them responsible for crimes against humanity. If you ask me my personal opinion, my personal opinion is they've committed crimes against humanity. Senator Risch. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in April of 2020, the prior administration proposed a, uh, a formal democratic uh, transition framework to facilitate a peaceful negotiated uh, return to democracy in Venezuela. What, what's this uh, administration's view of that uh, of framework? Have you abandoned that, embraced it, ignored it? Where, where are you on that? So uh, we continue to view a, a priority um, maintaining international cohesion and pressure on the Maduro regime, uh, working with uh, allies to deny the regime access to diplomatic benefits and economic benefits, to work to support the interim government and the unitary platform as they seek to uh, forge a path toward uh, a free, fair election in 2024. Um, we believe that we should use all of the tools available to achieve that goal, um, and we will continue to do that. Well, and is that your uh, 
interpretation of how you're it, how you're implementing this transition for framework, or, or is that off the table? The transit the transition framework itself is it off the table? We continue to work with the interim government. Uh, I think that the uh, structure of the interim government has changed over time, and the uh, range of recognition of the government and its status over time has also changed. So we need to adapt our policies uh, to continue to move forward um, so that uh, serious, profound, and irreversible reforms are undertaken to allow for a free, fair, transparent election in 2024. Well, I keep coming back to the framework, which you haven't answered the question yet. Are, are there parts of it that you've embraced, parts of it you've abandoned? How, how is your are you following the same path as what this framework laid out, or are you doing things different than what the framework laid out? Compare what you're doing mm -hmm. to the framework that was put uh, forth in April of 2020. So the framework put forward in April of 2020, I think imagined a scenario where uh, the regime would collapse. Um, we're not seeing, we haven't seen that over time. Um, the diplomatic uh, recognition of the regime has grown during that period. Um, more countries now recognize the Maduro regime than they did previously. Um, and uh, we have to adapt our strategy to take those factors into account. Well, uh, let, let me try a different line here. Uh, in February of this year, 2022, a senior White House official claimed uh, the sanctions imposed on Russia for invading Ukraine were designed to pr pressure the Maduro regime. I don't understand that, but that was the claim. A week later, that same official met with Maduro in Caracas in an attempt to buy oil from Venezuela. And soon thereafter, the administration started to ease sanctions on the regime. Um, can, you, can you explain to us how the administration plans to pressure Maduro while well, deepening U.S. reliance on Venezuela? So uh, Venezuelan uh, hydrocarbons are not entering the United States, to my knowledge. Uh, so I don't think our, our reliance on, on Venezuela has increased. The visit to Venezuela uh, by special, envoy, special presidential envoy for hostage affairs, Karstens, uh, Ambassador Story, uh, and, and the senior NSC official, uh, Juan Gonzalez, resulted in the release of two wrongfully detained Americans uh, and a resumption of serious conversations between the regime and the unitary platform. Those conversations have continued for um, uh, quite some time and have made notable progress. Uh, in my conversations, with the Norwegian mediators. They believe that um, the prospects for return uh, to a formal negotiating process are good, uh, and we will continue to use um, both incentives uh, and sticks uh, in close coordination with the interim government and the unitary platform to encourage progress. Well, let me take just a little different line here. What are you specifically, what are you doing to help the uh, Guaido uh, administration? We uh, provide funding and resources um, to the uh, democratic opposition in Venezuela, as well as funding for the uh, interim government. We work with allies to ensure that the regime does not have access to uh, assets uh, either in the United States or in foreign areas. We consult with them on um, various n negotiating strategies and policies. Our ambassador uh, to Venezuela, Jimmy Story, is in um, almost daily contact with senior officials uh, in the interim government. Uh, I myself have um, met virtually with President Guaido on multiple occasions. Um, as well as uh, regular contact with the interim government ambassador in Washington uh, and other interim government officials. I think my time's up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Senator Cardin has graciously agreed to chair for a period of time. I have to go to banking. 
And Senator Keynes recognized you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Risch, and to our colleagues who are here. You know, the, the, we just have to be realistic. I think the efforts of the last three administrations uh, to use U.S. influence for a significant positive outcome in Venezuela have all been failures. Um, our intentions have been good, and our efforts have been strong, and our generosity, particularly when compared with other nations, has been notable, but we've not seen the outcome that we want. Um, I don't think the last administration had us in a strong position with respect to Venezuela. They, they did announce a maximum pressure campaign pretty quickly in that campaign, the Trump administration floated the possibility of military intervention in Venezuela, and that stopped many of the nations that, were, that had been willing to recognize the interim government of Juan Guaido. It stopped them from going further with us and embracing the sanctions regime. Um, and I, I talked to leaders of some of the nations that were with us on the recognition of Guaido and said, as soon as the U.S. starts talking about military intervention, even if you ultimately don't go that direction, we're, we're on the off-ramp now, and we can't go further. Um, the last administration had witnesses before us, too, telling us that the Maduro government was within days of collapse. When we talked to the Colombians, they, they said, what are they smoking? I mean, they, they could see across the border uh, with this neighbor that they're so close to that there was no danger of the Maduro government collapsing. That was not likely the case. And so blue sky optimism that's unrealistic and bellicose rhetoric that's counterproductive did not lead to success. But, but I don't really fault them, the administration, just like I don't fault the Obama administration, just like I don't fault the Biden administration for not being able to produce an outcome in Venezuela that we're happy with. This is on the Venezuelan people. Um, we have limited ability uh, to uh, influence the outcome, and it strikes to me that the best thing that we can do is something we are doing, but we might be able to do more of it, and that is humanitarian support for the Venezuelan people, and hopefully creating space for them so that the day may come, possibly in connection with these 2024 elections, where mayors and local officials and others and opposition will have enough force because of the disastrous nature of the Maduro government to start to write a new chapter for their country. I think we have to be humble about our own expectations about what the United States can do. On that score, um, the U.S. government in the humanitarian space, we're the single largest donor to the U.N. humanitarian response inside Venezuela. 74% of the humanitarian contributions for humanitarian aid through the U.N. program are from the United States. What are, is the department doing to get some of our European and other allies to step up their humanitarian support. Thank you, Senator. The uh, regular engagement with our partners around uh, the hemisphere uh, and around the world uh, continues, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, on Tuesday, we had another uh, key meeting with uh, partners to talk about um, both our, our policies and the importance of providing uh, robust assistance um, to the Venezuelan people, both within Venezuela uh, and um, those who have migrated, uh, fled the, the horrible conditions in that country. Uh, we regularly stress the importance of donations to the uh, Humanitarian Relief Fund, uh, and we lead by example uh, in those donations. We will uh, soon, uh, next week, we have the UN General Assembly Leaders Week. There'll be another opportunity for us to engage at a high level. Uh, if, that. if I could, because I want to ask one more question, please do that. I mean, we're, we're being very, very generous to refugees in Europe, the Ukrainian refugees, for example, and, and I think to ask our European allies, mm -hmm. please help us with this massive crisis. There, is, there isn't we are leading by example, but there isn't a reason for the United States to be footing 75% of this bill when we're also doing so much elsewhere. What are the prospects? The, the opposition has announced they're going to have a primary next year to try to forward a candidate for the presidential elections that are hopefully going to happen in 2024. What are the prospects, your assessment for the opposition sort of unifying uh, behind a figure who can, who can bring together some pretty disparate elements among the opposition? 
I think the prospects are, are quite good. There is a recognition, uh, as my colleague said, uh, the elections uh, uh, last year in, uh, for example, in Barina State uh, demonstrated that uh, a united opposition can win uh, even under the most harrowing circumstances. However, they shouldn't have to uh, carry out either primaries or an election under the most harrowing circumstances. It is vital that the regime implement the recommendations of the European Union Electoral Observation Mission uh, and the Carter Center recommendations, uh, which would allow for a more level playing field for a general election and allow the, the primary process to proceed uh, uh, without outside interference. Thank you very much. I yield back. Let me thank uh, both of you for your, for your testimonies and your work. There's many tragedies in Venezuela, including the uh, human rights violations and the lack of de democratic uh, governance. I want to talk about the migration issue. Um, we know the impact it has on the surrounding countries, um, but the United States has been willing to accept uh, the Venezuelans that are here. It's my understanding we have close to 300,000 that are eligible for temporary protective status. So, if I might, let me just ask uh, Administrator Escoban if you could elaborate as to how we are dealing with the Venezuelans that are here. What are our uh, work visa issues? What are their uh, needs? And what outreach are we making in order to carry out our responsibilities in our hemisphere due to the uh, migration issues of Venezuelans? Thank you, Senator Cardin. Um, I, I know that we have provided TPS to Venezuelans uh, here, and uh, and I'll I'll refer back to to my colleague on our on our U.S. Uh, uh, position. I think what is important to deal with the flows of Venezuelan migrants uh, to our border is is as you as you said and and, and started your comment that this is a regional uh, phenomenon. Like of the seven million migrants in in, in Latin America, uh, six million of those are are Venezuelans, and uh, and of these Venezuelans, only three percent have actually reached our border so far. The displacement in Latin America is 17 times larger than from Latin America to the U.S. So we. Um, to be able to deal with those flows, the strategy that we are pursuing are a root causes approach, which is clear in Venezuela and involves a democratic transition, expanding legal pathways which, uh, so that migrants can migrate in a, with dignity, safety, and in a condition of greatest mutual benefit. And probably the most important um, activity in terms of numbers is helping countries integrate migrants into their communities, like the example I gave with Colombia. And we are helping and pursuing these, these, uh, uh, these three avenues to deal with this massive migration crisis. One of our concerns is that whenever there are vulnerable people who migrate, there's always the risk factor of traffickers and victims of trafficking and the dangers, et cetera. So clear information is, is vitally important. What steps are we taking to make it clear uh, our um, abilities in the United States to handle those that are at risk. No, you are correct that, uh, that the journey is, is terrifying, it's extremely dangerous, and we work with civil society organizations, for example, in Colombia, so that they can um, inform people of the dangers of, of, uh, of their travels north. I traveled to the Darien Gap with uh, Secretary Mallorcas and was able to see firsthand uh, what that eight-day uh, journey means for people. Uh, Doctors with our borders uh, has, uh, has shown that close to or over 80% of women that make this journey are, are, are victims of sexual violence. So uh, we are, um, are, are using our work in Colombia and throughout Central America to try to, to inform migrants of, of, of the perils of this journey and, of course, our Central American governments are also working to penalize uh, and increase their, their, the penalty for, for smugglers and human traffickers.
Secretary Nichols, I, I want to follow up on Senator Kane's point. He, he was concentrating on humanitarian assistance and the global sharing of burden. Uh, on the migrant issues, the surrounding countries, uh, I, I work with Senator Blunt on, in regards to Colombia. We know the impact it's having on that country as far as the numbers that are from Venezuela in that country making it more challenging for Colombia uh, to deal with its other challenges. What efforts are the United States lead, leading in, in, to help the surrounding countries deal with the influx of Venezuelans? Thank you, Senator. Uh, the United States has provided uh, nearly $800 million for uh, the communities that host migrants and migrants themselves within Colombia. Uh, we coordinate closely with Colombian officials on migration issues under the previous Duque administration in Colombia. The government agreed to grant their version of temporary protected status, and the Petro administration has vowed to continue the, and deepen that policy. Uh, in addition, we work with governments around the hemisphere under the structure of the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration and Protection, which was agreed to uh, under President Biden's leadership at the last Summit of the Americas. We talk uh, and work on concrete burden sharing and information sharing activities with governments um, from Canada to Tierra del Fuego. Uh, we are working to uh, increase law enforcement cooperation to take down illicit trafficking networks. Uh, we work to provide training and equipment to uh, uh, migration officials in countries around the hemisphere. Uh, Secretary Blinken has uh, co-chaired uh, two migration ministerials in Colombia and Panama, focused on mobilizing hemispheric and international resources to address the problem. Thank you. Senator Rubio. Thank you. Um, thank you both for being here today. Um, I guess the, the Secretary Nichols, uh, has the Biden administration ever offered sanction relief in return for the release of American citizens in Venezuela? No. The, uh, the conversations uh, led uh, by our special envoy for hostage affairs, uh, Roger Carstens, um, are uh, active and ongoing. Um, the, I believe that he has... Um, uh, briefed in the past, along with our uh, Ambassador Jimmy Story, on some of the conversations uh, that we have had. Uh, our focus is uh, securing uh, the release of all wrongfully detained Americans worldwide. If you are in a conversation with Roger Carstens and you are a foreign country, that is not a normal relationship. Uh, that means that you are engaging in activity which is reprehensible. Uh, and we will do everything in our power to secure the freedom of wrongfully detained Americans. Uh, I have a photo of Tommy Vidal given to me by his family that I keep in my office to remind me of the priority of this effort. No, and I understand, but earlier this year, the ambassador to Venezuela, Jimmy Story, and the National Security Council's Juan Gonzalez visited Caracas, mm -hmm. uh, ostensibly, as it was discussed, to, to, uh, as it was reported to discuss the release of American citizens. Mm -hmm. Um, so they were there for that particular purpose, and then there were these leaks or stories out there about how they had offered sanction relief in, in return for releasing, for example, the CITGO 5. So are, were those stories, those media accounts of the, the ambassador and, and Mr. Gonzalez's visit to Caracas, were those inaccurate stories? The visit had two purposes. One was to, uh, in close concert with the interim government and the unitary platform, uh, to uh, create a, a framework for... Uh, a return to negotiations in Mexico City, and two, to um, negotiate with the regime uh, on the release of wrongfully detained Americans. Uh, and we took advantage of that opportunity to also visit um, uh, imprisoned U.S. citizens right. and provide them with confidence. But, but I guess that's my question. So we sent the ambassador to Venezuela, we sent a member of the National Security Council staff to meet with the regime. It was not, at that time, it was not the hostage uh, uh, individual that's in charge of that. It was them. They went to talk about two things, 
a framework to get Maduro back to the negotiating table and a framework to release unlaw you know, un unlawfully detained, unjustifiably detained Americans. In exchange, I imagine the Venezuelans would want something in return other than a visit. What, as part of that conversation, were there offers made that if you re return to negotiations, here's sanctions relief. If you release these people, here's sanctions relief. The, the, I, I understand the, the hostage negotiator and the ambassador in charge of that is, has not done it, as you've testified. But as part of that meeting, is it? Because there's these stories out there. So I just want to know, do you know, are those stories false, that they actually offered sanctions relief in exchange for whether it's returning to negotiations or uh, releasing Americans? Thank you, Senator. Uh, as I said in, in my opening statement, uh, we are willing to modify our sanctions policy in response to uh, progress toward uh, uh, negotiations and concrete steps by the Maduro regime uh, in negotiations. Uh, and uh, that was discussed with the Maduro regime in close coordination with interim President Guaido uh, and the unitary platform. So just to be clear, the sanctions, modifications, you know, relief would be in exchange, for example, for them returning to negotiations, agreeing to return to negotiations. It's substantive progress in the negotiations. Okay. Because you're aware they've used negotiations repeatedly over the years to buy time, and, and, and uh, even the Vatican no longer is willing to step in the breach and put that together. So I hope that hasn't been forgotten. I don't want to run out of time. I want to ask you about something else that's happened. Uh, a couple things. Um, in June of this year, a cargo plane landed in Buenos Aires. The plane used to be owned by a U.S.-sanctioned Iranian airline, Mahan Air. It was illegally transferred to the U.S.-sanctioned Venezuelan state airline, Conviasa. Uh, I understand that it's now subject to a seizure warrant from the U.S. Department of Justice. Last month, I, along with Senator Ernst, sent a letter to the Attorney General asking him to cooperate with law enforcement. What, what is the status of the judicial process in Argentina con concerning the confiscation of that plane? So, so um, thank you for that, and uh, we will continue to use uh, uh, all the law enforcement tools available to stop criminality and sanctions What's violations. the status of the St process? It, there's an investigating judge in Argentina who is conducting an investigation, and we are cooperating in that process. I would have to refer you to the Department of Justice for additional details. So we're waiting for the Argentine judge? We, we, we it's are- It's their in, process, I understand. It's their process. We are okay. supporting that process. We have provided information into that process at, at various points, which led to the final judicial order uh, to seize the plane. Okay, thank you. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for being here. Um, in the last hearing that we had in this committee on Venezuela, which was two years ago, we discussed the disproportionate impact that the humanitarian crisis is having on women in the country who have been forced to flee. And since then, health indicators, including infant and maternal mortality rates, have continued to decline. As you pointed out, Ms. Escobari, um, women are a high percentage of the women are subject to sexual assault. They're also obviously vulnerable to human trafficking and other abuses. So you've talked about the, a number of the initiatives that we have to try and help address that. Um, but can you talk about how helpful you think it might be if we had a fully operating Office of Global Women's Issues with an ambassador to that position who had been approved so that we could help address some of those um, disproportionate impacts on women um, as the result of this crisis. Thank you, Senator, and, and for your commitment to girls and women um, across the globe. Um, as you said, women are disproportionately affected in these crises. The Venezuela, is, it, it's clear on, on sexual trafficking, but also just the humanitarian needs because they're the ones taking care of kids. Um, it is a big part of what we do and the lens that we take, and I would, I would support, as you suggest, um, any additional uh, support on elevating this issue. Um, Ambassador Nichols, do you have a view on that? Thank you, Senator, for your leadership. Uh, the issues uh, around gender and women, peace, and security are vital. Um, the confirmation of Dr. Gupta, uh, the president's nominee to lead the Office of Global Women's Issues, uh, I think is vital. Uh, and uh, as we work in the department on these issues and the broad range of issues, um, having uh, confer Senate confirmed people in these positions 
um, imbues them with an authority and a power inside our system and internationally that no matter how talented an acting career officer is, they cannot match. Thank you. I really appreciate your explaining the difference in that way because as we look at the number of um, nominees who are still pending in the Senate, it's really important to remember the difference they could be making for that very reason. Not because they're necessarily any more talented, but because that official um, moniker gives them added credibility. Um, one of the things that I think has gone mostly unnoticed over the summer is the Russian-backed war games in July with forces that participated from both China and Iran. And can you discuss um, what, the, what the regional implications are of that and to what extent we ought to be paying attention? That's not something the Armed Services Committee has talked about. Um, as we've talked about war games that are going on in other parts of the world, Again, those have not gotten the attention that some others have. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the presence of Russian forces in Venezuela, uh, Nicaragua, uh, the uh, relations between uh, Venezuela and, and Iran um, serve to promote instability in our region. Uh, they seek to be provocative. Um, they seek to interject uh, the conflicts from other parts of the world in our hemisphere, and we watch them very closely. We coordinate with our allies on them. Uh, I've had conversations with, with colleagues across the interagency uh, on this issue. Uh, I note that our, our superb uh, SOUTHCOM commander, General Laura Richardson, uh, has been traveling extensively in the region and talking about our positive vision for security cooperation. Uh, Secretary Austin uh, participated in the uh, Hemispheric Defense Ministerial in Brazil earlier this year to further that message about a positive vision of democratic security cooperation. Uh, and we'll continue to watch with vigilance uh, the activities of uh, Russia and others in Venezuela and Nicaragua in particular. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to start with you, Assistant Secretary Nichols. Good day. Um, I've got two issues to talk with you about. The first one is a constituent of mine named Matthew Heath. I'm sure you're aware of the situation there. Matthew has been wrongfully detained by the Maduro regime in Venezuela uh, in early 2020. Matthew was arrested in Venezuela's borderlands near Colombia under very questionable circumstances and on highly specious charges. Since then, the Maduro regime has held Matthew hostage, imprisoning him in horrible conditions, and reportedly subjecting him to unspeakable acts of torture. In fact, last week marked two years of Matthew Heath's wrongful detention in Venezuela. That's two years too long for Matthew, it's two years too long for his family, and certainly it's two years too long for me. So Assistant Secretary Nichols, the Maduro regime should immediately and unconditionally release my fellow Tennessee and Matthew Heath. And I'd like to know uh, from you what is currently being done to bring Matthew back to his family in Tennessee. What's the plan? Thank you, Senator. Uh, I share your views entirely. Uh, Special Envoy for Hostage Affairs, uh, Roger Carstens, has, uh, as well as our ambassador, uh, have raised this issue on multiple occasions with the Maduro regime. Uh, we've sought to do uh, all that we can uh, to secure his immediate and unconditional release. Uh, and in the meantime, we have insisted that the regime uh, should ensure uh, his safety and his health by improving the conditions of his confinement. Uh, we will continue to work uh, tirelessly to secure the release of all wrongfully detained Americans in Venezuela. I, I appreciate that. You know how concerned I am about this situation. I appreciate your continued attention and focus on the issue. Uh, it is tragic, and it's uh, certainly something that Tennesseans all have their eye on. The next topic is, is another one that you and I are uh, very, have, have discussed before and are very familiar with, and that's the Maduro regime's growing cooperation with communist China. 
Uh, in 2014, China and the Maduro regime upgraded their diplomatic relations to the highest levels, signing a comprehensive strategic partnership. The Maduro regime is the region's, region's biggest borrower from China. They've accepted an estimated $62 billion in loans over the last decade and a half. More generally, as Communist China has become Latin America's overall top trading partner, China's used the Belt and Road Initiative and other instruments to provide foreign direct investment and lending for energy and other critical infrastructure in Venezuela and also other parts of Latin America. For example, China has aggressively invested in Latin America's space sector, such as the Manuel Rios Bernari Terrestrial Satellite Control Base in Venezuela. The Maduro regime and China have also significantly increased their military cooperation. Between 2009 and 2019, Beijing reportedly sold more than $615 million worth of weapons to Venezuela, making the Maduro regime a top purchaser of China's military equipment in that region. China strongly supports the Maduro regime's digital authoritarianism in Venezuela. ZTE, a CCP-directed Chinese telecoms and technology company, directly helped the Maduro regime construct the databases and identity card program for the country's fatherland card system that rolled out in January of 2017. The Maduro regime has used the fatherland card system to increase social control, to increase their coercion, and their vote buying. So Assistant Secretary Nichols, what's the Biden administration doing to counter the Maduro regime's efforts there in Venezuela, to counter China's growing interference and malign influence in Latin America more broadly? We continue to talk uh, with our uh, friends and partners throughout the hemisphere uh, about the real, the real uh, relations with the People's Republic of China uh, and the Chinese Communist Party. We focus our efforts on what's the real cost of lending, what is the quality of the projects that uh, PRC companies are building. And I've seen with my own eyes, I think you have yep. as well, um, collapsing stadiums, mm -hmm. faulty foreign ministries, uh, bad roads that have been built by Chinese companies in this hemisphere. We've seen the debt trap that countries in our hemisphere have fallen into and the depth of the relationship between the PRC uh, and uh, Venezuela uh, demonstrates, I think, uh, to the democratic countries in our hemisphere um, wh exactly what kind of a partner uh, the PRC is in engaging with one of the worst countries uh, in terms of respect for human rights, rule of law, and everything else we value mm -hmm. uh, in, our, uh, in our region. Um, before time runs out, Senator, I just want to note that I was in Mexico. I followed up on the issue we discussed before. Yep. I can brief you online. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to both of our witnesses for being here today. Um, I was in both Mexico and Colombia over the August recess in part to uh, take a look at our Venezuela policy. It's really hard to overhype what a disaster President Trump's Venezuela policy was, this um, decision to push all of our chips into the middle of the table, all at once recognize Guaido and try to facilitate a coup. Um, made us look ham-handed and, in the end, feckless. Um, recognizing someone as the leader of a country who is not actually the leader of the country, it doesn't actually make us look strong. It makes us look weak. Uh, and we are stuck inheriting a policy that did not work, that has, um, in part, um, contributed to a humanitarian disaster that now brings thousands and thousands of Venezuelans to our border um, seeking salvation. Um, and so I support um, strategic engagement um, with a purpose. And that purpose has to be um, a election that draws the participation of all political groups and gives Venezuelans the chance to exercise their right to determine the future of the country. And so I've heard um, since Secretary Nichols, you suggest that there's a possibility of being able to get to uh, an election in 2024, but what does a free and fair election look like in Venezuela? What are our benchmarks to know whether this is an election that, that we can support and that the Venezuelan people actually have a, a chance at exercising their free will? Listen, I understand it's not going to look like an election in our country, right? Um, and I don't know that we should hold it to that standard, but we have to have some pretty clear uh, 
baselines? What are we looking for as we try to get towards uh, a viable election? Thank you, Senator. Uh, the European Union's electoral observation mission, I think, has provided the most comprehensive roadmap, uh, along with the Carter Center, to what that would look like. And it involves things like um, inequality of access and equality of access to the media, um, rules that ensure that electoral authorities cannot disqualify candidates arbitrarily, um, access to uh, areas to campaign, and a cessation of the abuses by security forces of opposition candidates, um, transparency in the preparations technically for the election and the conducting of the election. Uh, it means allowing uh, the opposition to carry out a primary process. Uh, as we've seen, uh, when they have unified candidates, they will beat uh, the regime candidates uh, even when everything else is tilted against them. Um, a key part of the discussions between the unitary platform and the regime will be the implementation of this process, uh, and we support that. Um, Ms. Escobar, um, there's no doubt that the humanitarian disaster in Venezuela is first, second, and third a consequence of the regime's unconscionable policies. But I think we should be honest that uh, our sanctions contribute to the humanitarian nightmare, and we can argue that there are good reasons for our sanctions. But um, what worries me is a GAO report from last year um, that suggests um, we actually don't have real good information about how and if our sanctions are contributing to uh, the humanitarian um, uh, crisis inside Venezuela. Um, the report found that Treasury and its interagency partners are limited in their ability to develop further actions to ensure that U.S. sanctions don't disrupt humanitarian assistance. Um, are you familiar with this report? Um, and if so, how is USAID engaged with our implementing partners to uh, mitigate this, these challenges? And how do we make sure that we have visibility inside Venezuela to understand what the actual impact of our sanctions are? As, as you said, um, you know, it's very hard to, to, to separate the secondary effects. It is also very clear that the deterioration of the economy uh, preceded the sanctions and that we have this capacity to work on humanitarian aid. And the government also has the capacity to have invested in many of the services that are now you know, not functioning in Venezuela. Uh, a lot of our financing and our, and our work goes to create a network of human rights defenders, universities, um, and civil society organizations that are getting information about um, where the most vulnerable people are, the nature of the crisis, as to target our humanitarian aid in, to those that are most vulnerable. And there's actually a very sophisticated and courageous network of humanitarian organizations that are on the ground that know where and uh, you know where the most vulnerable people are, and it is where we focus our our humanitarian assistance inside the country. Well, I look forward to speaking with you more directly about this specific report and your responses uh, to it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me uh, turn to uh, Maduro's unbridled criminality. Uh, lest some for, some forget who we're dealing with. I want to remind everyone that Maduro and his henchmen from his government, his Supreme Court, and the party are facing charges in the United States for drug trafficking mm -hmm. with rewards for their capture. Uh, as we all know, financial institutions in the United States and around the world have found billions, billions of dollars in bank accounts linked to Maduro's mafia state not using it for the benefit of the people of Venezuela. Billions of dollars in bank accounts linked to Maduro's mafia states, and that's just likely the tip of the iceberg. That's without all the gold that's being taken out through Turkey and Russia. So um, I certainly uh, do not believe that the plight of the Venezuelan people is of any consequence except primarily that 
of the Maduro regime. Uh, there's a reason seven million people have fled. How are the Departments of State and Justice collaborating to advance the international law enforcement cooperation needed to address the Maduro regime's criminality? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I couldn't agree more. The efforts uh, the, through the Department of Justice uh, uh, and, uh, and the Department of Homeland Security uh, continue to uh, investigate illegality surrounding uh, the regime. Um, obviously, there uh, is an ongoing case with regard to Alex Saab uh, in the United States, who was extradited uh, precisely because of his role in criminality. Um, there are numerous other uh, regime figures uh, who are under investigation, uh, and um, the international community uh, and the international law enforcement community uh, is attuned to this, I would just note, um, you know, that we discussed earlier uh, the Conviasa plane that uh, is in Argentina, uh, seized as a result of our law enforcement cooperation uh, for sanctions violations, uh, and we will continue to work with governments around the world uh, to pursue investigations. Uh, what additional steps can be taken to investigate, recover, and repurpose assets stolen from the Venezuelan people? I think it is vital uh, to continue coordination among uh, financial action task forces, uh, coordination among uh, government finance ministries uh, around the hemisphere, our coordination uh, in international bodies like the UN and the OAS uh, to make sure that we are focusing uh, not just on uh, the regime's uh, past activity, but their uh, prospective future efforts. We see what they are trying to do in terms of evading sanctions, um, tr uh, trafficking uh, in all sorts of illicit substances, uh, and we continue to flag that in our conversations with senior officials from governments around the world. Let me ask you this. What foreign policy guidance has the State Department given OFAC on targeting Maduro regime officials involved in kleptocracy? Uh, we continue to tell OFAC mm -hmm. that um, identifying uh, those responsible for uh, illicit activity is important. It is a complex and time-consuming process. Um, but we also uh, stress that uh, as we carry out these activities, um, we want to ensure that they are uh, deployed to maximum effect to advance uh, negotiation process uh, and concrete achievements in our relationship. The goal of our sanctions uh, policies is obviously to change the behavior of the regime. Well, uh, I'm afraid that we're not uh, achieving that goal. Let me ask you this. Uh, the regime continues to jail American citizens on bogus charges. Mm -hmm. He's tortured them. He's denied them access to legal counsel, medical treatment, and even contact with their families. He's used them at bargaining chips, and at least in one case, he's driven them to attempt death by suicide. Matthew Heath isn't only being unjustly detained, he's being methodically tortured and slowly killed, all while the regime keeps adding Americans to its gulags. He may have released two Americans in March, but he's jailed several uh, more this year. So can you describe how hostage issues fit in the context of broader U.S. policy objectives in Venezuela? How is the administration firewalling discussions with the regime related to hostages from broader U.S. foreign policy objectives? Uh, absent the immediate return of U.S. hostages, what concrete ask has the administration made to the Maduro regime to improve their abysmal detention conditions? Uh, the United States has placed uh, Venezuela at the uh, highest level, level four, do not travel, in terms of our travel warnings. Uh, we uh, implore American citizens not to go to Venezuela. Uh, in 2019, our embassy in Venezuela uh, closed, uh, so we are not able to provide uh, regular consular access to American citizens. Special Presidential Envoy Roger Carstens uh, and our Ambassador uh, Jimmy Story have repeatedly uh, 
raised the issues of wrongfully detained Americans with the regime. Uh, we have demanded better, we've demanded the immediate and unconditional release of all our Americans, but uh, in the case of, of Mr. Heath, uh, as we discussed with Senator Haggerty, uh, we have uh, insisted that uh, the conditions of his confinement be improved uh, as well. Uh, we have uh, stressed to the regime uh, that it, it serves no good end, uh, its efforts to uh, arrest wrongfully American citizens that it finds within its borders and that it's uh, the border region between Colombia and Venezuela in particular uh, is a dangerous area uh, and uh, should be avoided. Uh, anyone who is talking to special presidential envoy Karstens, any country that's talking to him, that means you don't have a normal country or a normal relationship and you are engaged in reprehensible conduct. Well, um, I appreciate that, uh, but uh, it seems to me that <clears throat> Maduro has continued to take Americans hostages and uh, thinks that actually that's a value to him. Uh, let me ask you two last questions. Uh, one is this 2024 election, that's aspirational at this point. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. But it's not, there's nothing, there's nothing that is established as a series of benchmarks that will get us there at this point in time. So uh, the European Union's electoral observation mission uh, laid out what I think is the best uh, roadmap and recommendations uh, to get to a legitimate free fair election in 2024. But that hasn't been agreed to by Maduro. No, it hasn't, and, and that is vital. <clears throat> so and when we talk about 2024, it's an aspirational thing. There may be some roadmap by the EU, but the regime has not agreed to it. If the regime has any interest in legitimacy and international acceptance, uh, it should agree to those recommendations and, and implement them immediately. Well, when you're benefiting from everything, when you've got billions of dollars in national patrimony, when you basically, the state is your, uh, is your personal piggy bank, then I'm not sure whether you care about international legitimacy. I, I wish the Maduro did. That's why I think we have to pressure. That's why we're going to offer legislation to do so. I have one last question uh, for both of you. It's unrelated to our topic today, but since we have the pleasure of having you both here at the same time, on September 2nd, I sent both of you a letter regarding U.S. democracy programs for Cuba. And while I appreciate the administration's continued commitment to these programs, I was deeply disappointed to see that the administration is ending support to initiatives that challenge the Cuban regime's trafficking of doctors and medical personnel. It's an unfortunate decision that comes at a time when the State Department is actually raising the profile of the Cuban regime's forced labor schemes in the annual report on trafficking in persons. So why then cut off funding to programs that support the victims of the regime's trafficking of Cuban doctors and help raise additional international awareness about the issue? So I might start. Um, we agree with you wholeheartedly on the importance of these programs and, uh, and uh, you know, it's clear that the Cuban missions uh, constitute forced labor. We had this program, we have this program currently that tracks and analyzes the human right abuses um, and our partners have documented all the issues that had led uh, to this determination, right? The salaries, retention of identity of documents, movement restrictions, et cetera, um, as well as the threats and punishments and other labor violations. So grants um, come you know, to their natural end and that's uh, the situation with this one. However, this is an issue that we will continue uh, to work on. So we have programs that are focused on educating the Cuban workforce on labor exploitation, including Cuban medical doctors and overseas missions, and as well as engaging multinational institutions and human rights organizations. So we will continue well, to- Well, I, I don't understand, Madam Administrator, why specifically end the resources that are unique to this program and then put it into the context of broader uh, uh, reviews that are taking place with other parts of the world. I, I, I think it's regretful um, and to be honest with you, I'm going to have to consider it as it relates to any requests for transfers of money from USAID. Um, Senator Rich, do you have? Uh, with that.
Uh, the thanks to the committee, there will be all, there, I'm sure there will be a series of questions, including some from myself. Um, the, the business, um, the, the, this, uh, um, the record, I should say, for the hearing will remain open until the close of business on Friday, September 16th. Um, please ensure that questions for the record are submitted no later than that date. We'd ask you to have uh, substantive uh, responses. And with the thanks uh, of the committee to our witnesses, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.